Welcome to the Steps Collective. Lizzie. Yes. Which channel will I find the words on? I'll email them to you. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, for those of you who haven't joined us before, and actually I'll turn the birds off now. Um, this, this all began, um, oh, not quite a year ago, but almost at London Climate Action Week last year with the start of a conversation which um, has turned into this growing conversation and community that feels very alive and exciting um, and enjoyable to be a part of. And the words that John is sending to me that have not yet come through as sort of what we wrote um at the at the start just to kind of um ground what we're doing and what we're trying to do um so this is probably going to be the first of a few times um today that I give you this instruction and um, but I invite you to um get into whatever position um you enjoy being read to if you want to close your eyes if you want to sit on the floor um however however you like um just while I share um what we're what we're here to do so steps show the easy place to start it is often mentioned even by the most experienced travelers in the regenerative space that they are continually finding their way if we are to follow, we must look to their footprints and consider where we might place our own first steps. Today, we're here to share stories about how regenerative journeys began. Taking action is easier when you see and hear how others started. These stories will start in the early stages with people alive to the unfolding environment around them. Hearing about the first steps of others can be a vital part of our own, but we will not walk alone. We help each other take these first steps towards a regenerative future, not as experts, but as parents, neighbors, colleagues, and citizens. Our stories are all different. To travel with efficiency and resilience, we must learn what works for others and find a balance for ourselves between them. There is no single answer to guide you, but many questions to orientate by. We want to help people shape a regenerative design for life, Navigating with uncertainty, switching between action and inspiration, moving before we think too much and yet thinking before we go too far. Nobody can be certain what is around the next bend or over the next peak. Hold on to your considerate, open and thoughtful outlook in our time together. There are many paths up the same mountain. So, um... Welcome. Um, I think it's me first, right, John? Yes. So what we're going to do is uh, Lizzie and I are going to share two things. Uh, and then Liz, Lizzie's got a, a lovely tertiary thing to quickly come back to. But then we will open up for thoughts, reflections, questions, stories of your own. But over to Lizzie first. Amazing. OK, let's try sharing my screen. Okay. Can everyone can everyone see that? It should say pluralism and regenerative practice. Yes. Right. Okay, lovely. So, as a few of you know, um alongside my day-to-day -day facilitation practice, I've been doing the MA program in regenerative economics at Schumacher College in Devon. And some of you may know that Schumacher College was founded or co-founded rather by Satish Kumar who spent time working with Schumacher himself, as well as Thich Nhat Hanh, Martin Luther King, and many other incredible people. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the ethos of the college is head and heart and hands. And over the last six months, as I've spent a lot of time in academic study mode, but also in living in community mode, I've really noticed a quietening in myself a desire for both withdrawal to some extent and introspection and not in an I'm becoming a recluse kind of way but in an I want to spend time in the world that I inhabit kind of way investing in real people real relationships and real problems that I can reach with both my hands 
So to put it another way, LinkedIn is a very challenging place for me these days. So what I've prepared today is gentle in nature. It's quite quiet in tone and it's reflective and reflexive in approach. And so for the second time today, um, I'd love for you to just start by closing your eyes and taking a deep breath and just noticing how you are today. Um, and then I would love for you um, to keep your eyes shut because I have a poem to read you. And the poem is um, a Mary Oliver poem and it's called The Uses of Sorrow. In my sleep, I dreamed this poem. Someone I love once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. You can open your eyes now. And so I think that many of us have come to this place, to this regenerative work, as we're calling it, because in some sense, we've all been given a box of darkness. And maybe we didn't realise that we had it for a very long time. But that box of darkness has created, in some cases, discomfort, pain, maybe insomnia, anxiety, even for some of us, chronic illness. It's unsettled us and awakened us to the idea that somehow our task is to respond. As Sherry Mitchell, the uh, amazing Native American lawyer, teacher and activist puts it, we're awake because our great great grandchildren will not allow us to sleep. And I very de deliberately um, didn't say our task is to do something. I said our task is to respond. Um, and the reason that I didn't say our task is to do something is I'm a little bit sceptical of the always be doing way of existing because I think that this too sits in our box of darkness. My very dear sister-in-law, Marquini Charrington, who is Māori, always says that the Pākehā, which is the white Europeans, are human doings, not human beings. She's always asking, where is the space for stillness, for connecting, not transacting? Why is everything about getting things done, material achievement and individual separation? And I've been thinking about this a lot recently, um, about how many of us have literally been educated to believe that success is independent, which is curious because it's both impossible and untrue. Why is it such a problem to be dependent? Presumably, because if we're interconnected in resilient communities, then we'll stop consuming as much and spending and spend less money and then everything will fall apart. And that's, of course, where things do get tricky, um, particularly in the academic degrowth conversations, because there are growth dependencies everywhere in our world and we can't just stop or not stop without doing profound harm to the most vulnerable in human and other than human society. All of which is to say that it's really complex, um, as all of us here recognise and probably feel acutely, we're deeply entangled in this world and knowing where to draw boundaries is a constant challenge. In a way, this is where design as a discipline can really help because narrowing the focus and working with constraints is where some of the best and most interesting work happens. And yet, understanding that the framing that we choose is illusory and should be flexible and porous is super important because if you make your container too hard and too fixed, you end up with externalities and look where they've got us. You also end up with what Nora Bateson so beautifully calls the possibility pesticide of rationality. And so what to do? So as we just said, STEPS is the acronym for show the easy place to start. And so my task, as goes for everyone who speaks here, is to offer something. I'm sorry if this chart appears fuzzily, but hopefully it's clear enough to be able to see what it's saying. So in ecology, there's this idea of the window of vitality, which sits between efficiency and diversity on a spectrum. It doesn't fall exactly in the middle. It leans towards diversity. So if, for example, you think about the most diverse, the most biodiverse ecosystems, they're typically on the edges. 
So whether that means the overgrown edges and hedgerows around a field or the places where ocean currents meet, they burst with life and have developed resilience largely as a consequence of their diversity. There aren't too many organisational spaces where the potential stagnation and chaos that comes from too much diversity is a real problem. At the other end of the spectrum is all too familiar. Efficiency likes consistency and homogeneity. It likes reduction, it likes predictability, and it likes logic. It is, as a result, very brittle, and if I may say so, very boring, if not downright dangerous. And yet, this is what almost everything is designed and optimised for. As much as we might be asked to design a creative solution to a problem, that the solution will also be efficient is assumed. Clearly, efficiency isn't always a bad thing, but its dominance as a criteria or a constraint in this moment is problematic. As the wonderful design theorist and political ecologist Arturo Escobar puts it, Can design's modernist tradition be reorientated from its dependence on the life-stifling dualist ontology of patriarchal capitalist modernity towards relational modes of knowing, being, and doing? And that's a lot of big and complicated words, and I could double tap on any single one of them and still be talking in an hour's time. But at its heart, This is a question about whether design can reflect the care, compassion, complexity, and creativity that exists in the other than human world, and which ultimately is life-sustaining, if not life-affirming. And I think for you to even be here in this space, the answer to Escobar's question really must be yes. In some sense, then, we need to find a way to stop solutionizing, or at least only thinking in terms of single solutions. One of the common aspects of much regenerative work is that it's contextual and place-based, and each place has a different set of people and ecological factors to consider. And as, as such, each will need to work in different ways, employing different practices, worldviews, and technologies which means we need to embrace a more pluralistic perspective, not privileging one way of thinking over another, and instead accepting that things will be more or less appropriate depending on the situation, and that we shouldn't seek to mold the situation to the solution, but be more flexible in our approach. And so for me, this always begins with embodiment and noticing how I show up what sensations, intuition, emotions, and knowledge are with me in this moment. And I think this is probably a bridge to John's work to think about multiple possibilities and approach each option with curiosity. There are some questions that are always worth asking. Who who benefits? Who's missing? Where does the power lie? What flows of money or energy or resources are present? What's the broader context? What are our primary concerns? What's needed now? And what else? And depending on how well we understand the answers to these questions will define how our designs create new ways of being and whether those ways of being entrench harmful patterns or offer something different and life affirming. So I guess what I'm really saying is the easiest place to start is by questioning everything, holding ideas respectfully but lightly. As my teacher, the regenerative economist Jay Tom says, do before thinking too much, but think before doing too much. Be skeptical of universal ideas or of voices that claim to have the answer in capitals. (laughs) Intellectual supremacy is just as damaging as any other kind of supremacy. And so even when action is needed right now, and the deadline for our project is right now, and a client is asking for a response right now, just be mindful that what is relevant and useful right now might need to change tomorrow. And don't let that create a crisis or a panic, but let that be an opportunity for growth. But of course, only the kind of growth that signals health and vitality, the kind of growth that affirms life. And I want to end my part of um, today's session with two final quotes. One, again, from Nora Bateson, and then another Mary Oliver poem. So first of all, the quote. 
The days may go drearily by, but small shiftings are making small shiftings. A change in the tone of voice in a conversation opens the possibility for humour, and a tiny shift in the gesture opens the possibility for several future generations of collaboration. And now the poem. So feel free to close your eyes again. This one is called The Invitation. Oh, do you have time to linger for just a little while out of your busy and very important day for the goldfinches that have gathered in a field of thistles for a musical battle to see who can sing the highest note or the lowest or the most expressive of mirth or the most tender. Their strong blunt beaks drink the air as they strive melodiously, not for your sake and not for mine and not for the sake of winning, but for sheer delight and gratitude. Believe us, they say, it is a serious thing just to be alive on this fresh morning in the broken world. I beg of you, do not walk by without pausing to attend to this rather ridiculous performance. It could mean something. It could mean everything. It could be what Rilke meant when he wrote, you must change your life. I'm going to stop sharing. Pause for a minute and hand over to John. Thank you. Um, that was uh, yeah. That was that was even that was even more beautiful than it you, when you sent it over before and I read it. That was wonderful. Um, oh, Chris is doing the, the hands thing. I think that's all like the silent hand clapping thing. Yeah, all that. Um, I am going to share a story about uh, the last five days. So I was over in Lisbon at a festival called Future Days. Um, and I wanted to bring some reflections from that, but also from a, a presentation I've done recently, um, just railing a little against the kind of, I think Lizzie captured it wonderfully there, the intellectual supremacy of some forms of futures. Sort of, it can be deliberately hard and deliberately difficult and only done by special people. So with that in mind, let me share screen. So you see that, Lizzie? And then it's just called Three Chords in Lisbon. Is it flicked to the next slide? You can see the two dates. Yeah, fine. Okay, it's working. Um, so I'm going to talk about two dates notionally. So London, July the 4th. 1976, and Lisbon, May the 21st, 2024. July the 4th, 1976, of course, is the date that the Ramones play the UK for the first time. So they are supporting the Flaming Groovies at the Roundhouse in London. I've never heard of the Flaming Groovies. I'm sure they were fine. But this is a big deal. This is the, the, kind of, the Ramones are well known by a certain group of people in London. Essentially, the emergent London punk scene. So... The Clash, uh, the Sex Pistols, the Stranglers are supporting. The Damned are about to play the first gig. This is a this is a big moment. Suddenly, everyone comes out and goes, "Wow, these guys are here!" And the great thing about the Ramones is they are different from other records that they grew up with because you can just jam along. It's super simple. It's easy to do. So everyone comes and across two gigs. So you've got the the, the Roundhouse gig. Uh, on the uh, the fourth, and then the next uh, night they play a sell out a sell out show at Dingwalls, and the whole punk scene is there, hanging out before the gig, after the gig, in parties, wherever else. And what it does is this really interesting thing that Rats gave you from the Dam talks about. So the same thing was happening in different parts of the world. It was the next generation getting angry. It made us realise we weren't alone. So suddenly, all of those feelings, all of that separation disappeared in a way in that moment, suddenly going, oh, hang on, it's not just us doing this, we are part of something bigger. 
It's interesting thinking about the social context at the time. You've got multiple strikes, inflation, unemployment, inequality, increasing social conservatism, unseasonably hot weather. This may be familiar to you. Um, but just feeling like that at that point in time, there's a lot when the Sex Pistols are singing No Future For You, you can see why. And of course, the musical context that rules against are, you know, McCartney, Queen, Elton John, Bob Dylan, Rod Stewart, ABBA, the usual. Um, they still sit in our kind of like cultural consciousness, squatting on generations today. But also you have prog, progressive rock. This perhaps best demonstrated by Rick Wakeman's 1975 show, The Myths and Legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. I shit you not, on ice. Um, so suddenly these are huge, massive, big, ex stadium expansive shows where, never mind less is more, just imagine how much more more will be. Prog is hard to comprehend and impossible to play. It's about transmission. This is not for, you're just here to listen. There is a mastery in this work. This is sort of like, this is just for us to do, come and wonder at our splendour. Whereas punk is the other thing. Punk is about participation. It's about step up and sing. Punk burns while prog fiddles. In thinking about this, in studying some of the kind of like the essays and the reviews of uh, and the books written about the time, you can start breaking down the three sets of principles. Punk's different because it's three chords. I mean, literally, there's a kind of like a, a page in the Sideburns fanzine, 1976 by Tony Moon where he just drew three chords and then said, there you go, that is enough to form a band. The whole three chord punk thing comes from this image. The media, how people share things. Suddenly, whereas everything used to go to official record studios and highly paid artists, suddenly it was like, no, it's whatever you want to make it into. It's however you can communicate that, it's okay. It doesn't have to be in a form that is somebody else's idea of perfect. And then, of course, you have the moments beyond the uh, the Ramones at the Roundhouse, we get to the Sex Pistols at the 100 Club and countless other moments where people are coming together and seeing others in the same scene. So with that as background, I wrote this talk earlier in the year about participatory future, in a way, is the punk to foresight's prog. It's about sort of like leaning in in just three chords rather than this, um, back to Lizzie's point, intellectual supremacy of foresight. Just quickly, I'll interject a little data here about Barcelona in 2015, which is the first year that I taught on this course, which is the Innovation Future Thinking course at IED in Barcelona. Um, set up by Scott Smith of Changist. Uh, I taught on it and then took over as course coordinator. But what we've done as a team has really grown it to be wherever we can, a futures course that's on the street and with the people. It's trying to participate with communities, companies, parts of the city, experts, academics, whoever it happens to be can, who can take the students who come at it closer to work with the people for whom the future of Barcelona really matters. And as Elizabeth, my friend who teaches on the course, talked about last year, interaction is not participation. So just asking people, just consulting, just asking them for their views is not quite it. Participation is not an aesthetic you can just label onto things. So we, again, reviewing the kind of like the the course and the things that we try and do it's like what is just enough structure to give people so that they feel i can i can go away and do that what's the media we get participants to create to say so like, oh no this is not done by a special high fluting graphic studio and vfx um to depict sort of like shiny futures this can be made out of paper and card and whatever happens to be to hand it can even just be acting out something to explore what the future could hold and then creating those moments where we get students together with people from the city who can use these future sites to make a difference and steer the direction. And an ID course is really how I ended up at Future Days in Lisbon, because my friend Christina, who also teaches the course, has been involved as part of the core team um, with Uri and Mary and others. And that's how I found myself there last week. So I arrived to do this initial city scanning thing. Because they've been given, and this is what really makes the, the conference different to ones that I've been to before or talked about before, is that they've been set a set of 15 challenges by the city. So they're working closely with the city and saying, look, okay, these things are problems. So beyond just having a nice conference in the city that people can come to and feel that, hey, Lisbon's a nice place, maybe we should set up here. 
it's about okay so how can we start using the people who are coming here in combination with the people who live and work here to start addressing these complex issues which feels from the, the steps collective events we've hosted so far let's just scream the same complexity out makes right like there are all these different interconnected challenges and solving one might cause a problem in another so what we did was we made a Portuguese version of the, some of you be familiar with the regenerative design field kit, just to put in the hands of the kind of all of the groups who were going out just on that first day to sensitize themselves to the city. So if you knew the city, the idea was this will give you a way to look at a familiar city in a different light, in a different way, to ask different questions of it. Or if you didn't know a city, it might give you an in point from your experience elsewhere to wonder what makes Lisbon contextually specifically different. So we set up a series of groups. So you're a facilitator per group, a mix of locals and visitors, and then a tour with local change makers who were trying to think about different ways in which the city might transform and what that transformation might mean. This was followed by two days of talks and labs. Um, some local participation, some people like me coming in from abroad, just to share ideas about sort of like what what are the tools that you can use to reflect on kind of like what's the, the problems with the present and what futures might emerge. And then our final working session. So addressing those 15 challenges from the city on these different tables for a two-hour session to close the festival. The output of that will go towards the report, which will be given to the city as the first future day response to these challenges. So to finish, I want to sort of bring it back to the reason we're here. Show the easy place to start. Because it's, it struck me as a really interesting event. It was very kind of like, it was fly by the seat of your pants at times. And that's fine. It was the, I have a friend who uses the phrase champagne for beer money. This was a champagne festival on beer money. It was kind of like, there was lots of, there was lots of kind of like frantic paddling under the, under the surface for the, the swans on top. But I wrote this, a series of notes as I was going through it. I just like, looked back and, and found this. Where is the participation? So I just wanted to look before we even started. I was thinking, okay, I just want to pay attention to where the participation is or could be improved to change this. So this is almost a show the easy place to start. So if you were trying to set up something like this or future days repeats in 2025, what might you do? I sat in the last day with uh, another attendee who... I won't name them because I've, I've sent them an email because they are travelling home. So I don't want to name someone uh, who said this in conversation until they say that's fine. But the point is this. They they observe that, you know, when, when you do it properly, participant futures is really just a lot of work. So back to the idea, Elizabeth's idea of, it's not an aesthetic. You can't, you can't just layer it on. It's kind of like it's going to meet people where they are, where they live, where they're thinking, where they're working again and again and again. It's not just consultation. It is just a lot, a lot of legwork and working with people side by side. And so some of the things that I'm coming to is sort of like, okay, so what sort of work might that be? How might we change our future days 2025 or other experiences like that to make them more participatory? and leaning on those principles of the means and the moments in the media. So the means. I kind of feel there should be, for future things like this, a three-chord rule. All talks and labs should show, tell, or involve people in something they can do later for themselves. So back to Lizzie's point again about the intellectual supremacy thing. Standing on a stage and selling people this great big kind of like woo futures vision what does that do for people in the context of sort of, yeah, but how can we take that away? What can we do with that as a result? Some of the labs are sort of just thinking about, sort of, how can we make this as easy as possible that this can be repeated and explored in the local context by people after this event? The Ramones uh, on that night in the round, as Johnny Ramone said to Paul Simon, you're going to see us for the first time. We suck, we can't play, but don't worry about it. Just do it. The more you are on the stage doing these sorts of things and you make it feel complex like prog, the less people are likely to pick it up and do something as a result. Don't put anything in ice is the shorthand for that. Nothing on ice. The second thing, media. I think it should have been more DIY. And I, saw, like, I, I reflect on my own work here with 
how can some of the things that we did to build those experience, how can we work faster with locals to shape the form of the inputs and the outputs, whether it's making the electroscopes locally with a group of people who says, right, okay, so this is yours now to to think about to think about those questions, to change those questions, to make a worksheet, to do the guidance. How could that be even more born of the place than it was? And I think that goes for all of the different worksheets that we were using all the exercises are like, okay, how do you make this more of the form that people themselves would want to express those different futures in? I was struck um, again by conversations on the last day. There was a group um, working on the, an aging population um, with some older Lisbon uh, residents. Well, it was just, it came to us like using sticky notes and A3 worksheets. How would older generations normally tell you about a future they want? Probably not with A3 worksheets and post-it notes. So I think there's an interesting reflection there. Like, what can you do to support a better, more participative way of expressing those outputs? And then finally, the moments. We had the tours on the first day and that was great. But thinking about it again, I'd have reconstituted that as a, a local a local Lisbon leader as well as a facilitator and a mixed co cohort who actually start and end this journey together. So rather than just doing this as an exercise to sensitize, sensitize people to the city, you're going, if you go through that two days and then you're sitting back around a table with the very people you started that journey with, looking at each other and going, okay, what can we do about it? Given all the things we've seen and learned and observed and the people we've talked to, what might actually make this a different thing for the city? Because I think the sort of that as a closing moment as well as an opening moment could be a really powerful thing. So, in summary, participatory futures. I had this shorthand, which I still like and I'm leaning into. It's fewer scenarios. It's fewer, fewer complex things, less intellectual supremacy, and it's more scenes. It's right back to that kind of idea of going. Like, it's an ongoing, evolving exploration where you just let a group of people who live in a place see each other. So the moment becomes suddenly you arrive at the round house and you go, "Hang on, all of these people are here for similar kind of reasons." And I didn't expect to see you, and I didn't expect to see you, but I was expecting to see this other person who I've not seen. And that's a conversation I kept having with local people. Who are going, I can suddenly see our evolving future scene. There's suddenly connections here that I can make and we can do more here because of that. So that idea of scenes rather than scenarios is the important thing. I think is the important bit about future days and the important bit about learning how to do more of these things. Fewer scenes, a few, a few scenarios, more scenes. Thank you very much. Very quickly, Lizzie, we we're going to hand back to you, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, so um, John and I just kind of huddled earlier today and John shared his talk and then asked me who was going to go first. And and my brain had just kind of gotten stuck because while I'd been listening um, to what he was going to share, I was looking at a pile of detritus on my on my desk, which I'll just hold up like bits of it. Um, so in the last module of my course I um I realized that I was taking all of these notes in kind of a traditional way and um then and they were not helping me learn anything and I had a bag with some crayons and highlighters in it and I had some um pieces of plain paper and I thought for the next lecture I'm going to make a zine and I'm going to just play and I'm going to listen and I'm going to see what comes out and um, and what has come out is like I don't know 30 of them something like that but while John was talking I was sort of reflecting on the in in that really specific scenario there's a way of um academic learning which is hard and and serious and at least for me as an individual doesn't actually work that well and I was reflecting on this not what's the way but what's your way and what's um a way that is accessible and resonates right now and this kind of constant challenge of um in in all of these little 
ways of the work can be joyful the work can be yeah things made out of like folded bits of paper and the impact that they have can be just as powerful so John suggested I I share as kind of a living example on my desk of kind of how this is like um somewhat synchronously synchronous don't even know what that word would be um bubbling up in my own work and practice but it'd be really lovely to hear from you all of what's resonating. Um, what are you all working on? Any thoughts, reflections, or of course, questions? Ben's come off mute. Yay, over Hi, to you. Uh, thank you both for those. They're, they're really um, brave and courageous, and I really uh, found them to be very valuable. Um, both of them so thank you so much it's really good to take a step back I think and sort of um, as you were sort of saying Lizzie to start with sort of just noticing things and being okay with you know some of that sort of it doesn't have to be perfect um, and actually sort of noticing how you're feeling about things and and that sort of multiple things can sort of exist at the same time and, uh, and it's really interesting hearing about your studies at Schumacher which I've sort of heard about and been interested in but haven't really kind of seen any of the kind of things in detail and and and, and those quotes that you shared were really interesting in that way and i totally agree about the sort of things feeling a bit too polished and um the, the prog rock versus punk analogy is genius actually and and sort of uh, i think that's totally brilliant so thank you also for sharing those john and um and I, i'm all for this idea of sort of seizing the means maybe and with the three chords and you know handing control over to people because it does feel like I think if you look at sort of sustainability and then that becoming regeneration and those thinking there's sort of a bit of control by by sort of established groups perhaps about keeping this thinking back rather than welcoming everybody in and and it's really it's a good challenge to see how those things can be kind of held to uh yeah a more diy uh sort of sense where you're kind of letting those things free rather than um keeping them back in terms of overly complicated models and and all of that type of stuff so yeah, I just do want to say I, I thought that I found those both very. I saw the link yesterday, and I kind of clicked the story. This is really interesting, and clicked on it, and I'm really glad it came because I feel like I've kind of woken up to some of those uh, sort of possibilities. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Um, thank you both uh lizzie we've not met before but you know you're in great company coming off that uh, regenerative economics course a good friend of mine did it last year and i went down last summer and it's just, i'm just like yeah there's a, there's a version of my life where i'd love to do it great people um john when you mentioned the scene there's the term um brian Eno has his awkward term senius which I, I really want to like it, but it, it, it never quite works. But, you know, the, the genius of a scene. He's been, he's been knocking that word around since the 90s. It's never quite stuck. Mm. And I'm, I'm trying looking in my notes to see if I had... I've, I've come across other people using terms like that, but I do think there is that thing of... What he's getting at is the idea that great ideas don't come up in isolation. If you look back, there's generally a scene. It's just that our existing models of how we... Um, uh, of how we expect greatness or great ideas or whatever, our sort of great man theory, which makes me sick in my mouth to say, um, yeah, it tends to ignore that these things generally come up through mutual support and interdependence and encouragement. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that word to the table. I think that's really interesting because the, um, my friend Phil had, when I just talked to him about a previous version of this talk, and he pointed me in the direction of um, how to build a scene in David Byrne's book, How Music Works, um, which, of course, is kind of like, again, speaking to a lot of the same sort of things as Eno's talking about with seniors. But actually, I think there's... Maybe I can share the link here. It tends to be, how do you make a scene without making a members club as well? It's what I'm always fighting. 
Well, this this is the kind of so some of the things in the David Byrne example are kind of like exist around that. Of kind of like rent must be low, it must stay low. Bands must be paid fairly. Performing music musicians must get in for free and maybe get free beer too. So it's kind of like it's really minimising the kind of like barriers at every point possible. Um, and so I think that's all. Like, there's there's definitely something in the kind of like the music scene, art scene, culture scene, ways in which you can take principles from other places and apply them if you're running a festival or you're doing this sort of work in, in a participatory way what, what, it doesn't have to be high end polished back to Ben's word before all of these different things Jim Hi everyone um, so it's probably useful me giving you a bit of background about who I am where I'm from so um I'm an RSA fellow, but I work uh, for DSTL, the Defence Science Technology Laboratory, which is part of the Ministry of Defence, and I work on our Futures Programme and on our Support and Sustainability Programme. And John and I have worked, John's done a bit of work for us before, and the presentation he gave was a version of one he'd given to us before. So uh, the bit that I'm interested in is kind of like where, what's the, so you talk about participation, John, as being a necessity, but what's the purpose of that? So there's a kind of, um, so there's a, I can see a need for that, for kind of engagement and building the groundswell type thing, but where does, where's the limit of it? So if you're trying to do plan for a, a multi-million pound thing in government or, a massive systemic change how does where's the limit of that and where do you need that kind of um unique expertise like people like you have and the kind of oceanographers group that we had deliver that does that make sense yes Sorry, i think so um, you won't get the references i made but i think the sort of the, the... As always, it's uh, 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 what uh, word of the decade is context. It's always context dependent, and the, in the context of those projects, it's sort of like that context can mean different things. My gut feeling, and I've done some other work with Welcome Trust that I couldn't share today, but I might share later. It's a, a, a model that myself and Caroline Ward have been working on around kind of like where participation begins and where just involvement stops and our kind of like our indication through kind of like the literature review whatever so there's always an option to make it more participative and what you will get is something that is different and it might not be expertise but it's expertise that's if you're classifying what expertise is it doesn't mean that the people who are going to let could take the work and lead it in a different way you don't have to judge them by the same barriers by the same um, criteria that you judge that expertise by. It will be different. People will express things in different ways, but they will be closer to the lived reality which they will have to deal with the impacts of said decisions, the way a device works when they have to work on it every day, the way a house works when they have to live it, the way a street works and whatever else. So I think it's kind of like, it's like unlearning what we think of when we think of expertise and going, what's the simplest way that I can move along that continuum and discover things that we can't get to? Oh, with lots of hands. So Mark and Anna now, hands up. So Mark and Anna. Hi, uh, yeah. Th thanks again, both of you, for those really inspiring presentations. Um, yeah, just to, to respond to that last little thread of conversation, really, um, I, I'm also doing a, a master's at the moment and very conscious of this danger of intellectual supremacy. Uh, I'm doing regenerative design at Central St. Martins and uh, and actually the, the tutor there is really, really great and she keeps challenging us uh, in a similar way, not to just be all up here in your head, <laughs> but to just get out into the real world and, and uh, learn from what's around you. Um, and I think that's got something to do with this. Uh, but there's a 
without wishing to be too sort of intellectual there's also some reading that i've been doing so it's kind of a bit of a dichotomy going on here but um as part of my course i've been reading uh, uh, some of the works by someone called karen barrard uh, or barrard i don't know how you present pronounce it properly um, but she's got this really interesting terminology of intraaction so not interaction but intraaction and i think it feeds into this conversation because the, the as i understand it um it's this idea that things are only things because of the way that they're they are relating to other things <laughs> you see what i mean I'm, I'm butchering her idea but um it's she's a quantum physicist as well as uh, a, a sort of a philosopher and communicator and all sorts but there's this idea that par participation is is a sort of a dumbed down way of understanding that our very being our very existence is constantly in motion with other things around us as well so i guess to, to sort of almost blow open this idea of participatory research or or uh, you know getting people involved it's like well they already are and there will always be these influences and, and movements and moments and it's about how do we uh facilitate the interaction so going to another level beyond maybe even just interaction and participation i've probably completely butchered that concept anyway go and read a book uh, i haven't read it yet but it's probably brilliant <laughs> It's there's there's something really nice in that, and I'll just like touch in quickly for here from Anna. But the the that it's 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 relational. It's the kind of like, and it leans into some of the so for instance, Carlo Rovelli's Helgoland, just talking about <laughs> just casual theory of quantum, quantum physics stuff. But it's that relational thing. Everything is only a thing because of its relations to everything else, and that's also true within um, so Keller Easterling's book uh, medium design which is always talking which is talking about sort of like the design you do is in between all of the things and not on the things themselves so and maybe this brings it back to jim's point a little into the sense of sort of look whenever we are working on these big projects and whatever else and so on, if they affect other people in any particular way when we deploy them that will necessarily change how they um change the, the circumstances in which they exist. Lizzie, do you want to come in? Oh no, I mean I was just I was just reflecting on Karen and um, on Karen Barad's work, which um because I I think, you know, well definitely in some context she'd be described as a feminist thinker. And I, I think in this transition there is a really um important conversation which I guess, is combination of feminism and queer theory and being able to, I guess, reject putting things into categories and abstracting contexts and dehumanising people as personas. And I was reflecting, Jim, on, on your comment because I think, I think it's a really... Um, important and difficult challenge of the thinking about what is now and where might we want to get to and right now we have a challenge of scale because we operate in a scaled way and so when you're talking about millions if not billions of pounds of investment in national or global infrastructure in the context of this conversation you immediately hit problems because you have moved out of place and out of community and kind of the opposite end of the small is beautiful convivial kind of context but that's also the reality that we have to deal with now and so I think I think um some of it is kind of holding maybe all of the different stakeholders needs in mind and maybe the first step is just becoming aware of the compromises that are being made and the harm that is being done. And that was harm that was maybe previously unconsciously done or not talked about or invisible and now making that visible so that we can begin to design organisations that have different organisational structures so that the scale is reduced without losing all of the communication and learning from each other like I very much sort of reject the we have to go back into small communities and not talk anymore and not share information and all of that sort of stuff 
But I do think we have a problem when we are designing for millions or billions of people as opposed to hundreds of thousands of people in specific contexts. That was just my reflection. Um, Anna. I love the reflection. So good. Um, thank you so much for your talks. They were really, really good. Um, I was reflecting a bit on this um, DIY and that we want to give people um, tools that they can do their things at home as well or like with themselves. Um, and so a small introduction. Um, we, we both work in a Dutch company um, a small industrial design company. And um, I'm as a designer, I'm just starting in this field um, and I'm kind of touching upon a few things. Um, but because I'm so, such a young um, designer just coming into this field, I sometimes feel like when you do things DIY, um, it feels, I'm worried that it comes across as lazy in a way. Um, but I do believe because I did study in the COVID times, I did do a lot of things with household materials so instead of like being able to buy a lot of fancy stuff I had to work with sponges and stuff like that so within me I learned to use to give people um, household materials to prototype and to ideate with so I do believe in this kind of DIY and that it is really useful that to give just people like things to reflect with instead of like yeah just uh, fancy stuff but I'm wondering how to prompt it a bit more, to give more um, possibilities that people see, okay, DIY is really important and making toolkits that are simple but powerful. Um, yeah, how we can kind of enhance that a bit more. I don't know if the question made sense. <laughs> it does, and I have lots of thoughts on this way. I'm happy to jump into, but I'll invite comments from other places first. Or I'll just speak. Go for it, John. I, I phrased that badly, didn't I? Um, well, I, I, I am, I am, I am, I am, and always have been a very kind of like DIY prototype, pretendo type. It was another t uh, phrase that was used a while ago um, by Alberto. I can't remember his name. Um, what I'm interested in from your reflection there is. So rather than the designer or the researcher making something at a, kind of a DIY level to give to a person or a community and elicit, so that's design research. You're trying to elicit kind of things from them by you making a thing to give to them. It's almost, is it inverse? Is it, is it almost like, sort of like I, want, I want a community to, kind of like to, to, to make, to tell, to show, something and i don't care that it's finished because what really is it's, it's, it helps support the way that they want to communicate so actually it's beginning to read diy objects as opposed to make them and use them perhaps to say you express to us in whichever way you want the sorts of future you might want as opposed to us using it in a kind of like a, a more linear product design thing so like it's early stage product design or service design i'm going to show you a quick prototype if it's if it was service design, it would be like paper prototyping. Going, Imagine this happens in the screen and this happens in the screen. How can you create the conditions in which people feel comfortable with expressing their views about the future in any medium they want? And I think that then sort of like raises interesting questions about how are people provisioned, skilled, brought up through the education system with the ability to do that and should that sort of be something we try and do more that is a super good reflection i really like that and i think that's the difficulty as well but maybe yeah. it's just uh yeah we just have to experiment with that as well nice. yeah it, 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 I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear if you experiment with that and sort of like and find ways of giving people mm. nothing but 
a, a, an invitation in which they feel comfortable to go to their kitchen and make things out of household materials and present it to you as a vision for the future. Yeah. Or just tell them sort of like this, but that, again, that's you layering in your construct of how you use household materials and things in a designerly way to make people come up with something. Like yeah. what's the kind of what's 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 the level above that where you say you can communicate this future in any way that you wish? Yeah. So maybe be dirt or a sponge or the wood. Yeah. Or or write as a write, write as a two minute play or. Mm -hmm. Or whatever again. happens to be the thing that you go okay look, how can you communicate that to us so that we can learn from it rather than us push the first object into your environment mm -hmm. and john that reminded me of you know if you're john meader's rules of simplicity or laws of simplicity is yeah, it? Like, yeah, yeah they're really cool ways of kind of trying to think about how to simplify stuff it's quite old now though yeah I have a copy. Could you share that maybe in the chat? That would be super helpful. Thank you. No problem. Um, I've noticed, Lizzie, we're notionally at time, but I'm. Uh, what we usually say is that it's now time, but we're happy to extend. But it does give people the opportunity to say, "Oh, this was this. this that's quite enough of that, and I've got an excuse to leave." Um. So what we'll do is we will close, uh, stop the recording, and then anyone else who wants to kind of look, hang out and talk some more, I can be around for a bit. Um, any final reflections before I close? Matt looks like he's going to say a thing. All right, then. I... Uh, I'll hand over to Lizzie for final words. Final closing. Um, well, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, it's brilliant that so many of you are here. Sorry that we weren't in person this month. Um, but actually, I think that we might have managed to um, have people who couldn't have been in the room with us anyway. We will be um, letting you know about next month's, well, April's date, which is almost certainly going to be in the first week of May. And we will let you know when that is um, and where it's happening. Um, and then, well, my closing words. So I am just going with kind of what's there. So I picked up one of my one of my little zines and there are a few things that are written on the, the back cover, which actually really resonate right now. Um, so the, the at the top, um, I've written Get Things the Right Way Round. Um, so where I immediately went to was kind of the taking time to just understand what is where. And for me, this plays into a sort of learned behavior to react to the symptoms as opposed to respond to the, the cause. So that was a nice invitation. At the bottom, I've written life is not a performance. And it was making me think about this, this DIY thing of particularly as professional designers or creatives, I think, well, again, if I look back at um, my training and my career, feeling really uncomfortable of not presenting something that isn't finished and doesn't look good enough and doesn't kind of show authority and credibility. There's something for me, though, in the finished thing, um, which stops all the energy it is that I mean I think it this is physics of like motion met with stillness like kills the motion like that's how you stop things and there is something about the not finished which both requires participation and keep things movement moving and therefore makes it alive so this idea of life is not a performance is that we can't have the finished thing because then it stops and it's all fake and so the the DIY-ness um, is real that was interesting and then i put in the the middle which um i feel like is is there's a great question to end with i've written the future is amazing are you coming so i'm gonna leave it there i think that was a rob hopkins session if anyone knows rob hopkins amazing thank you so much everyone we will see you anon Anon. <laughs> Bye.